welcome back to our series on what it means to forgive. You and I are walking through uh, the Word of God in a several part series. And I'm very passionate about teaching you on this because oftentimes inside of the church, we oversimplify the very complex topic of forgiveness, which ends up creating more confusion, and then we don't apply God's remedy to heal our wounds. And so um, if you are just joining us, whether on YouTube or on the Live Treasure podcast, I really want to encourage you to subscribe and to listen to all the parts inside of this series because one part builds upon the other. And today we're going to be talking about what it means to love our enemies. And before you turn this podcast off or think, you know what, I don't want to listen to this because I'm so frustrated with this person right now and, and there's just no way I could love this person. Boy, um, do I have a really awesome word for you today. You see, um, for many of us, uh, especially if you have struggled with codependency, you have a skewed version of what agape love is. That is the love that God commands that we give to our enemies. And that love does not look like being nice. It doesn't look like never saying no. No, that love is a bold, uh, fierce love that can only flow from plugging into God's presence. And so what I want to talk to you about today is God's agape love. And the first thing that I want you to see is that authentic love for our enemies cannot be manufactured. It must flow from our maker. And many times, if you and I are depending upon how we're feeling, what, what was modeled for us through our parents, we will not be giving people love. Many times what we're doing is we are enabling uh, people to continue in bad behavior or we're not allowing them opportunities to grow. And to illustrate that point, I want to share a story with you uh, about uh, my boys. When they were in school, one of the things that our school did is they had speakers that would come in and would talk to us. And one of the things that they uh, taught us inside of this seminar that they did is that it's so important to allow our children to fail, that when our children fail, that they learn from their mistakes. And they gave this illustration of a child that continually forgets their lunch and the mother that swoops in to rescue and brings the child's lunch to school. And when they were giving that analogy, I thought to myself, you know what, that's me. I'm continually, if my children forget something, I live 10 minutes from school, I'm gonna hop in the car and I'm gonna bring that to them. Well, the speaker pointed out that that's not really a loving thing to do. That oftentimes inside of our rescuing, what we're really doing is we're loving ourselves, right? We want to feel like the rescuer. We don't want to feel the guilt or the, uh, the, the just the um, uncomfortableness that comes from courageous love, right? I mean, we love our children and to see them walk through something hard, like not eating lunch uh, at school can be very uncomfortable for us. And you know something, I never saw it that way. I never saw it as selfish, as me wanting to be the rescuer, as me wanting to soothe my mommy guilt or um, not make things hard on me, right? Instead of letting my children uh, walk through difficult circumstances in order to grow. And, you know, when we um, have a skewed version of what love is. 
it can mess everything up. And passages like love your enemies can scare us. I mean, they can make us downright angry. Why should I love that person who offended me, who abused me? But when we look at what the Bible says about love, we see that God's love, his agape love is bold, beautiful, and brave. Now, one of the biggest um, reasons why this is very difficult for women is because of how we are raised, um, not only by our parents, but also what the world teaches us. We're socialized to be nice. That's what culture tells us, that being nice is a strong Christian uh, 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 virtue for us to take hold of. And so women who are raised to believe that loving others is being nice, It prevents the biblical love which God commands. I'm going to say that again. Women are often raised to believe that loving others is being nice, which prevents the biblical love that God commands. Now, the biblical love that God commands is agape love. Um, I want to just read to you this scripture, uh, Mark 12, uh, 29 through 30, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. You must love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment uh, is greater than these. Now, Jesus was actually pulling um, from an Old Testament scripture here, not just that first part of the verse, but the second part of the verse. Listen to Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Matthew 5, 44 and 45 says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And again, in Romans 12, uh, 20 through 21, it says this, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And so inside of that passage, one, we see that God in old Old Testament and new. He calls us to love him and to love our neighbors. And in particular, in that Leviticus passage and also in the Matthew passage, it highlights loving your enemies. Now, the reason why God does that is because it's very easy for us to love those that are just wonderful to us. But where the rubber hits the road is when there is an offense inside of our life. And there's just that feeling in us that wants to get back at that person and not extend any grace. Now, we've talked about, um, uh, and again, go back and listen to what we've Um, taught on, but that our responsibility inside of the forgiveness process um, has to do with not retaliating. It also has to do with shifting our faith away from our offender and onto God. We talked about that last week. And this third part that we're going to talk about today is that loving your enemies. Now, with sometimes when we see that, if we believe that loving others is, I've got to be nice to this person, I've got, I can't set boundaries, then we won't even like go there with God, right? We just close the Bible, we turn off the podcast, and we say, no, thank you, right? But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. You've got to leave. You've got to leave what the world says real love is. You've even got to leave, um, you know, one of the biggest ways that we see what love is, is we look at how our parents love. 
how they loved us, how our parents loved each other. And that can also teach us a lot. You may have come from a household where the, the, the mother accepted the abuse, the emotional abuse. And so for you, saying no to abuse, drawing lines, drawing boundaries, potentially separating yourself from a situation can make you feel guilty. But what if it is really love? What if it is really love? And here is the truth about what you need to do. You must leave what the world says and what your parents modeled for you, what they told you about love, and look to the Father in heaven who is love. The Bible says that God is love. And so we can't look to how what our parents taught us, what society has taught us. We must look at our Heavenly Father at the Word of God. Listen to this scripture from 1 John um, uh, 4, 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, a few things inside of this passage. The first thing that I want you to see is that the love that God wants you to have for your enemies, you do not have to manufacture. In fact, the love that you should have for the people in your life that you have those warm, fuzzy feelings for, like even, you know, my children, like I was talking about initially, all of that agape love comes from God. That's what this verse said, love comes from God. So God is the source of agape love. Now, we have like one word for love love, right? But in the Bible, there are lots of different words for love that describe different types of love. The love that God is commanding you to have for enemies is agape love. Then it says, anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. And sometimes, see, you and I, we have to leave like we have to leave the what our parents taught us, what the world taught us, and we have to start living as a daughter of the Most High God and looking to Him inside of His Word to tell us um, what love is. Then it says in verse 8, But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. See, so God is love. Now, the, the biggest revelation that I got in my journey of codependency is, is what the source of love is and how love operates. And the way that it was explained to me is this, is that I am merely a vessel. I'm like a watering can. I have zero power in and of myself, just like my watering cans cannot water plants. I cannot love people. What I can do is I can connect to a source, just like a watering can. You can put the spigot into the watering can and fill the watering can up. And then the watering can has the ability to go out and to nourish plants, okay? So in similar fashion, in similar fashion, you and I are like watering cans. We are like vessels. And in and of ourselves, if we try to love our enemies on our own, we will not be able to do it. In fact, even the people that we are so crazy about inside of this world, love comes from God and it comes from plugging into his presence. And here's the other thing. Love is also, it is bold and it is brave sometimes. And it sets boundaries sometimes. And it says, no, you know, sometimes love isn't nice. And I don't know about you, but this gives me a lot of courage and it gives me a lot of peace because it lets me know that my heavenly father who loves me and who wants the best for me and who is my protector 
protector and my defender is not going to tell me to go out and let somebody abuse me again, right? Because sometimes love says no. But if I am like a watering can, and if I'm going to people to get love, or I'm trying to do it on my own, right? Then I'm going to just fall apart. Go back to that analogy I gave about consistently going to school and bringing uh, my sons their lunch, okay? So what was I doing in that scenario? I wanted my children to give me love, right? I wanted to be the hero. And so I was looking not for, out for their best interests. It was a selfish act. Can you see that? Because... I did not want them to experience any discomfort and I didn't want to experience any discomfort from seeing them go through discomfort. Now, I'm not saying that you never bring your lunch to your children at school. I'm certainly not saying that and we're going to get into that too. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit on that. But I'm saying God used that scenario um, in my life to really drill home this point that agape love does not mean that I must be nice all the time. Because you know what? It is not about me. It is not about worrying about the perception that other people have about you. It is not about every single relationship being neat and tidy. And so, you know what, in this video, I wanna go through three lies about agape love um, especially as it relates to loving our enemies, and then the three truths that you can find in God's word. The first lie is this, love is a feeling I must manufacture. Now this is super important, okay? Because if, if you feel like that love is a feeling, then you will be very frustrated because you're going to be trying to drum up this warm, fuzzy feeling towards somebody that has hurt you. And then if that's the benchmark, the enemy will take that benchmark and he's going to use it to accuse you. He's going to tell you this lie. If I don't like somebody, then I must be holding unforgiveness. And it's just not true. Everybody knows if you've been listening to my uh, YouTube videos that I'm a fan of Lois Treverberg and her work. She really unpacks the Bible from uh, and just really unpacks um, the culture, what was going on at the time, what the Hebrew words means of, of this and that. But one of the things um, that she says is that when God commands us to love our enemies, he may have been thinking more about our actions toward them than our inner affections. And then she goes on to say, when someone acts cruelly towards you, you don't need to deceive yourself into thinking that he or she is really a wonderful person. That is not what God is calling you to do. But what he is calling you to do, because love is not a feeling, love is an action that God will give you actions to take, okay? But I don't know if that doesn't set you free. I don't know what else will because so many women I talk to say I'm struggling with unforgiveness. And, and I always want to say, you know what? Let's look at that, okay? Because God is not calling you to like everybody. Now, love means that we are not going to repay evil with evil and we're going to treat everybody with kindness but it doesn't mean that if you don't have these warm, fuzzy feelings, right, that you're holding unforgiveness towards somebody. Now, God is going to ask you to extend actions of love toward a person. And sometimes, and this is what I love about the timeless truths in the Word of God, sometimes it won't even be that you have any contact with that person. The one thing that God calls every person to do is to pray for our enemies. And that is an act of love, right? And a lot of times if the relationship was toxic, if it's been abusive, 
when you do the act of praying for somebody, you can pray for that person to see the light, for the scales to fall off that person's eyes. And that is a very loving thing that you can do. And it doesn't require that you put yourself in a position where you're going to get hurt again, number one, or number two, where you're offering that premature reconciliation. We talked about that in videos one, two, and three. Go back if you missed those. But offering that premature reconciliation to where your fender uh, does not get, get healed. Um, furthermore, if you believe that love has to be a feeling, you know what you're going to do? Because I did it for years. You're going to pretend you're going to pretend like everything is okay and you like this person. And when you pretend, you don't process the pain and you push it down. We talked about that um, in, in our video last week. Um, so, so love is, is that's a lie. It's a lie that love is a feeling I must force and manufacture. No, love is, it is fruit from plugging into the presence of Jesus. If you don't like somebody, you are not living in unforgiveness. You can still choose to take the high road, to not stoop down to their level, and to be kind towards them. And that's a big difference from, from being nice and, and, and from uh, 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 pretending. And it all flows out of plugging into God's presence. Go back to that scripture in Mark where God says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. In that passage, we see the flow of God's agape love, right? That we love God. And from that place, we will have what we need to love others. And notice also in that passage, it says, love your neighbor as you would love yourself. You would never condone abuse in yourself. I hope you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. And so you're going to draw boundaries with a person uh, that, that does that to you. And this brings me to my second point, the second lie that we can believe about love. And that's love always says yes. Love always says yes. The, the enemy will say, you know what, that you're telling somebody no and you're setting a boundary and that means that you're walking in unforgiveness and bitterness and it's not true. You know, love says no and it never enables abuse. In fact, you've got to start to flip your perspective. It's not how your mom interacted with your father. Love does not enable abuse, right? And when you look at um, the Gospels, I'm not even talking about looking at like the Lord in the Old Testament. Look at Jesus. And there is, there is instance after instance where the Lord Jesus says no to people and he sets firm boundaries with people and he's bold and he confronts and many times he puts people in their place um, especially the religious Pharisees and he calls sin out you know there's a great book if you're interested in reading more there's a great book I'll leave the link to it um, in the description but it's called Bold Love uh, by Dan Allender. It's a great book to read um, on this subject. The next lie is this. Love is a formula that I follow. It looks the same for every person. Not true. Not true. You know what? As a codependent, we want a checklist. Like, what does it mean in this scenario? Give me what I need to do with, with this person, with my husband. And you know what? It doesn't exist. Now, that's that codependency tendency inside of you that is ready to fix, that is ready to cross things off your list, that wants to do your part, your role, or it's that 
that need inside you that needs to be good, that needs to be nice. And so you want to do the right thing, but love is not a checklist. Love follows the promptings of the Holy Spirit, period. The Bible says that wherever the Lord is, there is freedom. And you know what else there is, wherever the Lord is, is love. And so our actions towards a person will always be loving as long as we're following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And if you start getting into checklist mentality, it will backfire. Why? Because you will be operating in your own strength. You will be like that uh, watering can that is just trying to do it all on its own. You've got to plug into the source of God's power and you've got to go to God and say, Lord, show me how to love this person. You know what? Um, God and, and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity all in one, they hold justice and mercy in their hands in just the right amount. And here's the thing, they hold love and truth. And, and here's the thing, you do not have to let go of love to hold on to truth. And you do not have to let go of truth to hold on to love. Now there's this tension, right, that, that exists between mercy and, and justice. And if you look at inside of the Bible, when God leads people to deal with others, right? Uh, I, I think about the book of Joshua and, um, and when Joshua um, came across his first conquest, he was told to march around the walls of Jericho. Then when he came to a different battle, there was, there was a different battle plan. And you know what? It is an epic battle for you to love those that hurt you. And it is navigating through these waters that are sometimes difficult to navigate through. But guess what? You need to use discernment and you have the discernment of the Holy Spirit when you plug into him. And any action that you take that is not prompted by the Holy Spirit is not born out of that authentic agape love. And see, when you and I, when we come to God and ask him to give us our role, what are our actions? How do you want me to love this person? Um, and, and the Lord will tell you. And sometimes one of the things that God will tell you to do is to confront that person. Sometimes bold, brave love must confront. Um, now that's very biblical. Matthew 18, 15, Luke 17, 3, Ephesians 4, 15 talks about speaking the truth in love. Now, um, for me, um, I have spent the last two years really learning about um, uh, uh, how to confront. I, will I would say that that is a muscle that I just never used for a long time. Why? Because when you're a codependent, you need everybody to like you. And it's scary to confront people because what if they reject you? What, what if they don't validate that word uh, towards you? But you know what? Con confrontation um, can be extremely um, beneficial. And, um, and, and so I'm going to be leaving a couple of links on that. One or two YouTube videos um, that, that I did on confrontation. And the other is to a book um, called The Miracle Moment. And it, it's excellent. And it's just a great book to sort of help you to navigate and learn through how to confront people. But do you see where sometimes... Love means that you're going to have to do the uncomfortable. And it may not mean, right, that that person is going to like you. That's not the goal. In fact, um, the whole reason why God put me on this 
uh, journey of learning more about confronting others was from a question from um, a viewer from YouTube and they were asking me about confrontation. And so it sort of sent me on this journey with confronting others because I thought, you know what, you know how I handle confrontation. I just don't do it. And I looked in the word of God and I saw that, you know what, that is not biblical that God calls us to confront. And, um, and one of the things that I saw and even that I experienced because I ended up writing letters, I wrote two letters to um, two people in my life where there were deep, deep wounds. Um, and, and one of the things that I saw that, that God spoke to me that I wanna share with you again, but you can watch the YouTube video on it afterwards. I said, Lord, what is the purpose in this? Because, you know, I think the reason why I didn't confront before is because, you know, I was looking for validation. And a lot of times when you confront somebody, they are not going to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I hurt you. And you're right about that, right? Because nobody likes looking at um, that messy side uh, of, of themselves. So then what is the purpose of confrontation? You know what? The victory is in bringing volume to your voice. It is in you saying, hey, that wasn't okay. It is in you shedding light on the truth. Now, those people, they may not, you may not see fruit. You may not see change. That's between them and God. But if God is calling you to, to confront, you know, it helps you to walk in forgiveness. It helps you to just address the issue um, and, and release it. And sometimes beyond confrontation, sometimes the Lord says you need to separate. There are some relationships where the most loving thing that we can do is to have physical separation uh, from that person um, and, and to, to stop. And see, um, an example would be, you know, um, sometimes we are enabling um, addictions. We are enabling the person to continue on their, their um, path. And you have to say, the most loving thing I can do for that person is to put space between uh, you and me. And see, you can be confident in the wisdom that God gives you. And you and I can deal with our offenders in wisdom by walking closely with the Holy Spirit. And it is not the same for every person, which is why it's so important for you to stay close to God and for you to listen to the Lord, not your feelings. And also listen to this, you know, be careful too that you don't get caught up in how somebody else handled an offense or a situation because, you know, somebody, God may have led them. They may have had victory. There could be this major reconciliation. And a lot of times when that happens, somebody will try to put um, the, the way that God gave them to handle that situation on you and say, you should do it exactly like this. Now, it's always good to listen to wise counsel, but you are accountable to the Lord. You are accountable to him. And if you press into him and ask him for wisdom, he will speak. You know, one of the things that we do inside of the Treasure Tribe is we teach you through the Nourish Bible Study Method how to press into God and get that wisdom, that daily navigation uh, for life. And see Hebrews 4, um, starting with 12, says this, The Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. See, when you get a word from God, and we can teach you how to do that inside of the Treasure Tribe, inside of our 21-day challenge. Um, it, there is nothing like it because you can stand in confidence on that. And when you do things like love others with setting boundaries, 
And if you grew up inside of a situation, if you marinated um, with family members that consistently enabled abuse, it's going to feel real guilty. But you can have confidence if you stand on the word, that the word that God has given you, the direction that he has given you is the loving thing to do. Verse 13 says this, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. See, God knows the whole story and he knows how to tell you how to handle your offender in a way that will not only be healing to you, but will also be healing towards that person. You know, um, if, if my children, when they were young, if they came to me and said, Mom, I want to eat this whole chocolate cake, you know what? It would not be loving for me to say, go ahead, do whatever you want to do. No, I, I had to say no. Why? Because they would get a stomach ache. It's not good for, for their health. And see, I knew all that. They didn't know that, right? They didn't know about that. They were little then. They didn't know. And see, what, what God is saying here is I know everything. I know the story behind your offender. I know what happened to you. You lean into me. Nothing is hidden from me and I will direct you. And see, sometimes we pull away from God instead of pressing into him because we're afraid that loving our enemies means signing up for abuse again. And it's a bold face lie. Listen. You do not have to let go of your faith to let go of abuse. You do not have to let go of your faith, faith to let go of abuse. All right. Then it goes on to say this. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he, he, God, he is the one to whom we are accountable. You know what? You're not accountable to your offender. You're not accountable to your feelings, giving in to those feelings of guilt after you've set a boundary. You're accountable to him. And agape love is led by promptings of the Holy Spirit as we pull into God's presence. We are called to love our enemies, but not as the world tells us, not as maybe what was modeled for us growing up, but what God has for us, authentic agape love for our enemies, cannot be manufactured. It must flow from our maker. And see, here's the cool thing. When we give agape love, it heals. Not only for us, but it sets the table um, with your offender for real reconciliation and for real healing to happen on your uh, offender's part because, see, it makes room for the offender to change. And, you know, the other thing that happens when you stand with God and when you take the high road, you stand under his power and you stand ready to gain his reward. You know, I love this scripture um, in, in Romans. It says this, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Um, and let me read to you what this one commentary said about this verse. The description of heaping burning coals is a reference to Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. In Egypt, there had been a custom to carry a pan of burning coals on one's head as a sign of repentance, kindness, and forgiveness to those who abuse us ideally will make them ashamed of themselves and hopefully bring them to repent. The strongest, most powerful response to persecution and hatred is to love your enemies. And not only that, but when you love and you don't respond in hate, and you know what? You don't have to hate your enemy. You can turn that hate 
onto another person, right? Like if you don't, if you feel like I'm supposed to be nice to my enemies, you might still be carrying that feeling. You might not address it correctly and you might take it out on somebody else or you can take it out on you. You can turn all that hatred in on yourself, but no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna overcome evil, right, uh, by doing good. I'm and gonna leave you today with three takeaway points. Number one, always begin in prayer with love. It's a safe way, it's a good starting point to love your enemies. When you pray for them, Ask God, is there any action you want me to take? And no, if God gives you that action to take, he is going to give you the power to do it. And when you do it, you are standing, aligning yourself with the power of God. And also by asking him, you're admitting your need. God, I cannot love this person on my own. Give me your steps to take, not a list from uh, a friend or necessarily even from a counselor. Um, although good advice is, is always good to have, you must go to God uh, first and foremost and say, is there any action that I should take? And then finally, remember, you answer to God, not to the enemy who's accusing you, of being unforgiving because you don't have warm, fuzzy feeling towards a person or because you've set a boundary or because you're not following a specific checklist or formula. You're not accountable to the enemy. You're not accountable to your offender. And also be careful that you are not holding yourself accountable to any inner vows inside of your life. I will never do this with that person. I will always do this with that person. You are accountable to God. Be led in freedom by the Holy Spirit and understand that this command to love your enemies is just that. It is the freedom that God wants to hand, hand to you. You know, the enemy wants to bait you and keep you trapped to your offender. And God says, not only am I going to bring you into a new beginning, I'm going to hand you the keys. Thanks so much for listening in today, and I'll be back next week with another video on this series. <laughs>